Watching episode eight of Summertime Rendering, I really do feel like the mangaka probably watched one of these two shows before they did this segment. There is just a lot of really goofy faces, and I don't know, I'm... I, I feel like it's one of those things where I like this, it's funny, but don't do it every two seconds because it loses the, the funniness of it. But anyways, excellent episode. Unfortunately, kind of kills a lot of theories that I've been putting together. Obviously, if anybody's been watching my episode-by-episode episode impressions, one of the big key theories I had was that Ushio was somehow disconnected from her shadow. We kind of already pretty much confirmed that she is a shadow, but my theory that I was going with, and I was kind of looking to see if we probably see Ushio's shadow again, is the idea that she has been dis she is this clump of flesh that is a perfect copy of Ushio, but her shadow that was essentially controlling it was disconnected from it. That would explain why this perfect copy isn't, you know, working with the other shadows. But <laughs> again, at this episode, we finally see the shadow. Shinpei touches it and she reacts to it and yes technically Shadow Mio shreds it so that theory is gone I still believe she's somehow connected to Dr. Hishikata I, I still believe that Hishikata has some sort of way of manipulating the shadows themselves because again based on the last reset him sitting inside this room with a shadow in a wheelchair it kind of feels like Hishikata has some sort of way of manipulating him. And yes, technically, being Dr. Hishikata, he's the one that everybody brings these people that are being cremated to, and he's the one pretty much covering things up from the background. So I, I think we technically will eventually, at some point, have four factions. We have Hizuru's faction with Nezu. We have Shinpei, who's the, the neutral party that's trying to figure things out. Then you'll have Hishikata, and probably the government involved somehow. And then you'll have the shadows. And yeah, I guess you can call Ushio's a separate faction as well. She's the she's the betrayer, so to speak. So, but she's technically Shinpei's team. But yeah, getting into episode eight, <laughs> starting things off with him in the kitchen. Ushio's there. He panics, hides her, you know, makes some food for everybody. This was kind of one of those oof, goofy moments where he's trying to get away from them to hide Ushio, and it kind of turns this whole thing where Mio believes that he's trying to take <laughs> Ushio a set of food as well, which that turns into kind of a really bad sore spot in this episode that I, I honestly was kind of expecting, but really uh, it came out of nowhere for me, I guess, is this idea that eventually they start getting into the history of Shinpei and Ushio. Yes, he lost his family. He was brought in by Ushio's family, and they became basically siblings. And at some point, Shinpei left, and seems to be implying that the reason he left was because he loved Ushio. He really did love her, and if he was to remain there, he would just be her stepbrother for the rest of his life. He didn't like that. So he's like, I need to get away from here. There's a place over here that, that uh, Alan has set him up with where he can work to becoming a chef, and at the same time, it can create that separation between the two of them, and unfortunately, that turns into him never being able to see her again, which is super unfortunate. It's like the idea that you're trying to create that separation with somebody so that you can be in love and, oh, you, you lost your only chance to be with them or your chance to be able to protect them. But during this moment, he's essentially falling into what Hijiru was warning him about. These people are exact copies and they will trick you through you speaking to them for too long. And yes, that's pretty much what he's getting with Ushio. Now, I don't disagree with it. <laughs> it's like I see both sides of the argument, but from his perspective, he's ready to kill the shadow Ushio. He's got a knife ready for her. He can stab her shadow. He tests it. And yes, she reacts to it. He's like, oh yeah, this is a shadow. He's reminding himself that this is a shadow. But at the same time, they're having all this, you know, reminiscing and how much she loves his curry. And she's looking for, she's been looking forward to this moment. This is what she said that she wanted before he left. Can I eat your curry one more time? Now later. This is that finally that moment that she finally gets to eat. It's like, ouch. <laughs> it's like, ouch. You take advantage of the times that you have. And the moment you say something like this, it's just, it, if tragedy happens, it's nothing but regrets. And that's what he's having right now. But they kind of get a little in agreement here. Ushio really wants to stop this whole situation. She wants to work with Shinpei to put a stop to the shadow. She doesn't want this festival to happen. Which we do establish in this segment that, yes, it does look like Ushio knows about what happens at the festival. She's wanting to warn Shinpei, and Shinpei's like, yeah, you know about it too. And she's like, oh, you know about it too. That both of them are kind of... Equally in a loop. It hasn't really described completely what Ushio remembers, if it's the similar to what Shinpei is, because we're assuming that Ushio gave Shinpei the eye. Now, it brings up question mark as to why the eye is 
mother's Heine's when he has that eye that was given to him by Ushio. Did Ushio steal it and give it to him? Why is it the same color as Ushio's? That part's already bringing up a lot of question marks for me. I'm kind of... Uh, my theory currently is a loose theory in the idea that Ushio, or at least her family, is bloodline tied to Heine, which would explain why she can give up one of her eyes and it be equal to giving up the eye of the mother. So... But we'll see where that goes. That's like super loose theories right now. On the side, we do have Hizuru and Nezu, and they're currently watching the house, waiting for when Shadow Mio would show up based on what Shinpei said. Of course, Nezu is really implying the idea that you need to be ready, that they're not going to follow what exactly Shinpei says. They, they don't really have the habit of doing what you want them to do. So adaptability is important, which I argue at this point, yeah, you completely miss Ushio going in there, so you're probably... Oh, yeah, there it goes. There's Shadow Mio slipping in. <laughs> it's like, there's two shadows you guys missed, but it's to his point. This is where we get <laughs> a really funny scene. <laughs> Good scene, too. Shinpei finally asks Ushio, why are you always wearing this swimsuit? Why why don't you change into something else? And then she, moment she realizes it, it just it disappears. <laughs> and of course, she has to punch him because it's his fault, obviously. But it is that whole idea of them copying something or copying the code of something. And I don't know why her realizing it would cause a despair besides just to make etchy moment. I guess that's it. That, try not to overthink it, Andrew. It's just literally for etchy moment and to get her into nothing but a t-shirt. <laughs> Let's be honest. But yeah, this leads into the fake out of Shadow Mio coming in the door, which ends up being supposedly regular Mio coming in, talking about reminiscing, saying that he's, you know, wanting to eat a meal with Ushio and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But she does mention something that, again, might be interesting later on. It's kind of similar to the festival thing. This idea of something that's kind of casually stated that could possibly be important later. And that is that Katakiri had once said that on this island, the souls of the dead will return back to their home to become protective deities. So... Again, might insinuate this idea, going along the lines with all that stuff about the deities, washing up sore, burning them away. This could be something else that could be added to that. Or that Katakiri is involved with Hishikata, and they are taking bodies and <laughs> rechanging them back into living beings. That whole thing. I fully believe that Katakiri is working alongside Hishikata, the doctor, and covering up this stuff. And what better way to use this this temple pope guy to explain to people why they end up seeing their dead relatives walking around. Well, let's make it into this idea that they are these deities that come back and protect people. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it too much. And the moment that Shadow Mio walks in, she immediately goes after Shinpei. Ushio protects him. This is an interesting little exchange because as Shadow Mio is frustrated with Ushio being a traitor, she's like, why are you siding with Shinpei? Well, Ushio's like, well, <laughs> why is it a shock? I'm protecting the one that I love. And again, this is one of those moments where you have the shadows almost conflicted with their own self. Like the flesh itself is conflicted with the shadow that it's controlling it, essentially. As, yes, Shinpei goes over there, grandstands, opens up the curtains, they shoot her, and then he stabs her shadow. The shadow Mio essentially is conflicted right here. Like, I too loved you. And she whispers something else, and it didn't really give us an idea of what that is. So hopefully, eventually, I don't know if it's she was trying to say something, but... It looks like it kind of hides what she whispers in his ear. But yeah, it's one of those things where this shadow is asking why this other one is essentially working against him. Like, we're sisters. We should be working together. Oh, yeah, disconnecting from the idea that this shadow should love this person if it's a perfect copy. And then, yes, realizing themselves. Oh, yeah, this flesh itself also loves Shinpei. It's a conflict. It's one of the more interesting aspects of the story has been for me is the conflict between the shadow and the flesh itself. The desires of the flesh overcoming the soul is, is essentially, I think, what they're kind of paralleling here, obviously. But yeah, that's when Hizuru comes in, nearly tries to kill Ushio. Shinpei is protecting her at this point, saying, you know, look, this, this, <laughs> like I said, something like, she's protected me two times now. She's clumsy. She, she's definitely Ushio. <laughs> And this is a conflict for Hizuru. Hizuru hates these things and wants to get rid of them. And now Shinpei is here, an asset to her, but somebody that is now, well, Rinosuke, sorry, uh, protecting them. And that really frustrates Rinosuke. Rinosuke wants to finish this thing off, which does lead them, obviously, to the point where Rinosuke and Hizuru can no longer work alongside Shinpei because he's working with Ushio. Yes, she is siding with them now, but eventually Ushio could fix herself and become an enemy once again. But additionally, the fact that everything's shifting right now because Shinpei is now presumably working with Nezu and, and Hizuru's now in the Shadow's Eye, 
they can no longer work side by side. He's now a target and everything is shifting. <laughs> I love Ushio's responses with all this stuff. It's like she pours something on her arm, which makes it completely disappear. No longer bleed, obviously. But they're like, uh, your arm doesn't work like regular human arms. So we can't, can't just fix it. It's like do, disinfect it and stuff, but it just disappears. But <laughs> she was like, ah, the pain's gone. Like the arm disappears, but the pain's gone. So I don't care. Finally, at this scene, we'd also get uh, Hizuru confirming with Ushio that she had called her. That she has this voice recording on her phone where Ushio is telling her, the shadows are coming to attack, please come protect us, Shinpei is the key to defeating them. Which makes you question why immediately Hizuru would leave after having that confirmed. But th this does confirm to us at least that the shadow Ushio did not send that, at least to our knowledge, because she doesn't remember it. But it is Ushio's voice. So this kind of throws out my theory that I had before that Shinpei had contacted Hizuru, when in fact it was Ushio. It's just that Ushio told them that Shinpei was the key. It kind of insinuated before that it was Shinpei that contacted them, so. My assumption is that it's the real Ushio. The moment that she's seen her copy, she immediately contacted Hizuru because she was researching about shadows and this whole swamp thing. And that's when she got in contact with her and was notifying her. And yes, technically she would have known Hizuru, even though the shadow copy is totally ditched to that whole thing. <laughs> I forgot to mention, I did like the scene where Shinpei was guarding Ushio and uh, Hizuru's like, you're, you're being poisoned. Like your mind's being poisoned by being around this thing. You need to get rid of this thing. And he's like, I know that you hate them, but this is Usho. She's protecting me. I want to keep her safe. And Runo, I'm, I keep mixing it up. Runosuke says, I'm going to kill you if you're siding with them. And he's like, okay, you can, you can do that. And then I'll come back the next loop and I'll try to convince you then. Like, it's like, it's basically saying, go ahead, but I'm just going to keep looping until we, you finally allow this. So you might as well allow it now. But in this post-battle meeting, they are acknowledging the idea that not only, yes, is Shinpei now a threat to them, they're they're going after him directly. But they additionally, they are noting at this point that it seems like the shadows are communicating. And I think I mentioned this before, but I believe that this writer is going to be going down the hive mind route where all these shadows are of a hive mind. They're able to communicate. And yes, technically that Ushio isn't connected. And that's why I believe that Rinosuke can foresee when th something is attacking. because Rinosuke is a shadow that has connected himself to Hizuru. So yes, when Shiori died, Shadow Mio knew because they're interconnected. Following this, they open up Alan's shop again and they start serving food. That's when Tetsu shows up. He gets the phone from Tetsu and then So shows up. And then, so we get the whole situation where Shinpei goes out with So to explain everything to him. And yes, shows So Ushio. And that completely makes him freak out. Really cute outfit for Ushio, by the way. I just like the fact that he has him get an umbrella beforehand because obviously it, it rains that day. Now, honestly, I still don't trust So. <laughs> I think every time he meets up with So, as much as Simpei wants to trust So, there's something about So's family. And again, it's I think it's the aspect that he's tied in with Hishikata, which somebody had to point out to me, which I... I didn't realize until I actually looked into it, which makes sense because So is talking about the autopsies and he's looking into information. We still don't know what So was looking into in the previous loop, but this was an interesting thing because So is very conflicted by this. Obviously seeing Ushio, he felt like he should have done more. He he apologized for not saving her fast enough. And so it weighs heavy on him. And it feels like he's got the opportunity now to really apologize when it's not really her if he explained things properly. But I do believe that Tokiko... I think my biggest suspicion is on Tokiko. The, the, that last statement that she said in the last loop about dirtying her hand for no reason, I believe that she somehow is more connected in with what Hishikata is doing than So. I think So is going to be the brother that's outside of the norms of the family. I think Tokiko is going to be more involved with what Hishikata is doing, or at least looking more into it, and that she's doing something alongside him that eventually leads to nothing. Again, dirtying my hands for no reason. I think Hishikata is dirtying his hands as well, but he doesn't see it that way. But yes, finally, <laughs> finally we get to see what's in Ushio's phone. Why the real Ushio left her phone to Tetsu to give to Shinpei. And I, I, I knew it, like the moment that Ushio is like, oh, I, I don't have the password for it. Oh, the fingerprint reader works. And I'm like, okay, so that, li that, that allows us to see what's in the phone, but that we can't unlock the phone. Because, yeah, easily she could just unlock it, go in there and change the password, but in the next loop, he's still not going to know what the password is. There's, there's going to be no way that he's going to be able to open that phone without the pre the physical presence of Ushio. They put a stipulation in there to prevent them ever being able to look at that phone again in the future without Ushio. But yeah, apparently there is a video in there of the day that Ushio died. And they start the video and the episode stops. It's like <laughs> such a tease, dude. Like just such a tease. Uh, so we'll have to wait until next week before we can see what was on that video. But like I said, excellent episode. I think mostly because it finally answers the questions I have around Ushio as a shadow. Does she have a shadow? 
does seem like she does. So I have to I have to adjust my theories. But great action scenes. Yes, goofy moments, even though they're overusing the dramatic faces. Hopefully they chill out on that. And yes, getting to see Ushio without the Mizuki. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to hit that like button down below. Comment. Let me know the thought of the episode and my crazy theories that I keep throwing around like crazy. Subscribe if you have not already. Share this video if you can. Support us on Patreon or throw a tips link in the description below. We also have a super thanks button. We definitely appreciate everybody that supports us. And y'all take care.